Good morning, folks. Um, why don't we get started? Welcome to our first annual AI and Science Engineering Day, an event organized by our fellows in the Eric and Wendy Schmidt AI and Science and Engineering Fellowship Program, a program of Schmidt Futures. I'm Bill Curry. I'm a professor and associate dean in CES, the School for Environment and Sustainability, and a co-director of the program here at Michigan. It's my honor to introduce our first speaker, but first I wanna say a bit about the Schmidt AI and Science Program um, and a little bit about the day today. Schmidt Futures has funded the AI and Science Program here at Michigan and eight other universities in the current round with more universities potentially to be added later. The program will fund 55 postdocs for two years each here at Michigan alone. The Michigan program sits at MIDAS, the Michigan Institute for Data Science, a cross-campus initiative focused on data science and AI. This program is a major investment by Schmidt Futures meant to catalyze the use of AI in exciting and novel ways to move science forward. The thinking behind this was that AI research is making a number of exciting advances. We're seeing them in our everyday lives and we're seeing them in businesses but they have not penetrated the sciences and engineering as well as they could. Schmidt Futures defines AI very broadly as having four major elements, machine learning, Bayesian inference, simulation, and robotics. Our goal with this program is to support and train fellows working in all four of these areas and across a wide range of uh, schools, colleges, and units here at Michigan. So far, we have fellows and mentors representing physics, astronomy, chemical engineering, statistics, environment and sustainability, ecology and evolutionary biology, and a number of other disciplines. We're now onboarding the second cohort of 10 fellows that'll be starting this fall. This symposium today is organized by our first cohort of postdoctoral fellows who've been in the program for only two and a half months. The symposium today is a key example of the type of campus-wide outreach and collaboration that our program at Michigan seeks to promote. We wanna catalyze creative and novel uses of AI in science and engineering not just through the fellows, but by engaging the entire campus in events like this. A few key things uh, that you'll see today, talks from prominent researchers and industry leaders who've implemented AI in their own research, an introduction to our AI carpentries, a training paradigm that has enabled our postdocs to build a strong AI methods community within their interdisciplinary cohorts, viable opportunities to learn how you may adopt AI methods in your own research, advice about how you can connect and collaborate with a broader community of AI methodologists, both within your existing research network and from other disciplines. The day today includes a number of networking breaks and an opportunity to network over lunch at 12.15 and finally a, a reception for all attendees at 4.15. Now it's my honor to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Sarah Beery. Dr. Beery is an incoming assistant professor MIT Eeks Faculty of AI and Decision Making and CSAIL. She's also a visiting researcher at Google. Her research focuses on building computer vision methods that enable global scale environmental and biodiversity monitoring across data modalities, tackling real world challenges, including strong spatio-temporal correlations that lead to domain shift, imperfect data quality, fine grained categories and long tail distributions. Dr. Berry received her PhD in computing and mathematical sciences at Caltech, where she received the Amore Doctoral Prize for her dissertation. She was honored to be awarded both the PIMCO Data Science Fellowship and the Amazon AI for Science Fellowship, which recognize senior graduate students that have had a remarkable impact in machine learning and data science and their application to fields beyond computer science. We're very lucky and honored to have her here with us today. The title of her talk is Computer Vision for Global Scale Biodiversity Monitoring. She's gonna be telling us about the need for a real-time modular earth observation system, able to use computer vision for monitoring of global scale issues in ecology, sustainability, and conservation. Welcome, please join me in welcoming Dr. Berry. Hey everyone. Uh, I don't know, can we see this? Hmm, I can see them. <laughs> I can just like try plugging stuff in. That might be a bad idea. <laughs> Everyone having a good morning? <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's just, I'm just plugging it in. Cool. Thank you. 
Awesome. Can you guys see this okay? Good. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think that uh, this program sounds really exciting and very sort of like aligned with my own interests, which are, you know, I, I really, I got into this in the first place because I wanted to work on big environmental problems. Um, I was, I was always really much more motivated by the the big questions than maybe the specific AI methods, but I also found that we needed to develop new AI methods to actually tackle these problems in the real world. Um, so I'm going to be talking about kind of like a broader picture of like what this specific um, interdisciplinary area looks like now and then some of the work that I've done in this space. Um, but then I'm also going to finish by going into what I think are some of like the very big, exciting research questions, these open questions that we need to tackle to be able to do this effectively, um, maybe in the hopes that some of you are interested in working on them as well. Um, okay, so why do I work on biodiversity? Um, it turns out that we are facing, like many things in the world, a pretty major biodiversity crisis. Um, we're, lo we're losing species at a faster rate right now than we were during the last extinction of the dinosaurs. We are just living through a mass extinction of species. And those rates of extinction have been shown to be increasing exponentially across the taxonomic tree. So it's not like we're only losing insects or we're only losing mammals or birds. We're really seeing an increasing rate of loss across the taxonomic tree. Um, and not only that, we're also losing animal populations. So just the number of living animals on earth is shrinking, shrinking really quickly. So just since 1970, then within the lifetimes of most of the people in this room, um, we've actually lost 69% of the animals living on earth, which is really striking, right? Um, and when you hear those numbers, it's just really hard to wrap your head around, but this doesn't just affect you know, animals and plants, this is really something that is it also intrinsically tied to human societies. So, you know, biodiversity has been shown to be intrinsically tied to climate change, not only in the sense that climate change is one of the factors that is majorly impacting this reduction in biodiversity, but also that biodiversity itself is a big factor in climate change and in the way our carbon um, cycles form. For example, there's really interesting recent work that looks at how elephants are actually in, like majorly impacting carbon sequestration across the African continent. Um, biodiversity is tied to public health. As we see reductions in population size, we basically see reduced genetic diversity. And that's, you know, that can be due to fragmentation of habitat. It can also just be due to some of these other impact factors reducing the population size of these species but reduced genetic diversity leads to increased susceptibility for disease. And this shrinking of habitat and these intersection points between humans and wildlife where we're seeing coexistence, but also conflict, those are also these opportunities for the spread of zoonotic disease. And so what we see is, you know, things like global pandemics are maybe more likely because we are seeing more interaction between a species that is at risk, that is under threat, under stress, and therefore more susceptible to disease. It's tied to our food security. Not only do we have, you know, shrinking biodiversity of pollinators, there's recent work that's showing that diversity of pollinators is actually directly tied to the nutrition that we get out of the food that grows. So it's not just enough to like maybe save one species of bumblebee that's going to pollinate all of our corn. We actually need more diversity in pollinators to get more nutrition from our food. Um, and it's tied to ecosystem services. You know, this is everything from carbon sequestration, which is talked about a lot, but also, you know, things like forests and the biodiversity and the stability of those ecosystems lead to soil stability, lead to, you know, helping with stormwater runoff, um, you know, re regeneration after fire. All of this um, is really very fragile. And so I'm not by far the only person interested in studying biodiversity, interested in understanding, better understanding where and when and what is at risk globally and what is thriving and how things are changing. Um, and you know, this had been something that had been studied for hundreds of years, but really in the last about 20, maybe even only 10 years, this huge increase in hardware 
in our ability and sensing modalities, our ability to collect data has led to this real explosion in the data, in the types, the diversity and the scale of data that we have access to about the earth. And so this is everything that like we work from everything like mobile sensors from this, some space, you know, different satellite, um, different satellite modalities to lower flying aerial data that can be drones, low flying aircraft like EOS. We work with on animal sensors, bio loggers. These are, you know, collars or sometimes like suction cup, like dart gun things that stick to whales, um, all sorts of really clever and amazing ways to get both information about where individual animals are going, but also jointly collect environmental information, things like um, ocean salinity and temperature or air quality. And then we work with stationary sensors. These are networks of static cameras that are motion triggered or, or bioacoustic sensors that are motion triggered. Um, and sometimes really on the scale of, of millions and millions of data points coming from these sensors every year. And then community science data. And this has actually become by far the largest scale biodiversity data sensor that exists. It's just people, people with their cell phones going out, collecting information and uploading it to data repositories like iNaturalist. Um, and that's all really exciting because we've been data deficient for most species on earth for most of human history. And now we're starting to get to the point where we could maybe understand more, but the traditional paradigm for ecology really does not translate to this new space where the scale of data is so large. So traditionally an ecologist would go out, they would put out maybe their network of camera traps. Those camera traps would collect some images. They would take those back to their institution they would spend some time going through the images and basically doing this processing or this translation with their human brain, which is what is the relevant information that is encoded in these raw pixels? What species are we seeing? How many, what are their interactions? Whatever is pertinent to their research question. That doesn't work when you have a network of camera traps that collects 10 million images in a single year. I have a network of camera traps in Kenya that collected 10 million images last year. I, even if I had an army of undergrads, that's really no longer a tractable problem. Community scientists have now gathered, this slide is six months old. That number is now 120 million species observations. So when I say the amount of data coming from community science is growing, I really mean it. Um, 120 million different species observations in iNaturalist, but these are community collected and community labeled. And that means that there can be noise and we need better ways to try to figure out whether the, the categorizations built by these communities of passionate community members, passionate citizens are actually really valid as scientific observation. And then aerial surveys, like this is an example of a drone-based um, survey to try to count the population of animals. So right now, um, the, the countries of Kenya and Tanzania are flying a grid over their entirety of both countries for a year to try to get an accurate census for the entire elephant population but a single one of those flights can generate over 200 terabytes of video. So it doesn't work without automation. This does not work. We cannot get the information we need from the raw data streams without computer vision and machine learning. And that's where people like me, researchers like me come to play. Um, and that I think there really are so many opportunities here, but there are also challenges. The computer vision community has really been seeing amazing advances in recent years. Um, I'm sure you've all seen ChatGPT in terms of like natural language processing, but even, you know, even just simple things like being able to identify on your phone, like who people are that are in your community, um, being able to, to move towards self-driving cars where we're capturing information from cities. But it turns out that this biodiversity data is not necessarily firmly in that domain of data where there's already a large amount of data with really well curated labels. And we have a bunch of challenges that we really need to build new methods to address. One of those is that the data just does not often have a human photographer. Sometimes data does, I naturalist data, but this is camera trap data. So this is automatically triggered. And if you think about all of the data on the internet, most of it has a human photographer. Most of that data, you know, people have put on social media, for example, there's been a human that has pointed the camera, focused it, zoomed in, and giving you this nice clean image of what you care about. But for us, you know, there's a giraffe hidden behind the tree up there in the upper right that we would want to categorize. There's, 
there's potentially animals in this fog or in the dark. And then we have a ton of data that's empty, which basically means the biologist or the ecologist, the zoologist that collected that data, they were interested in one specific type of question. So for example, this data was from an ecologist that was interested in studying impala. So now all of the data that doesn't have impala in it for that ecologist is empty. It's data that they don't care about, but there's bycatch in there. There is so much more information that we aren't collecting because it's, it's like hidden away and siloed away in all of these data collections that are separate. And so even if there's not a single animal in these images, this is an amazing longitudinal picture of the intersection between a microhabitat and environmental covariates. And so what can we get out of all of the data we've collected? What can we expand in terms of our knowledge if we're just better able to process and extract this bycatch, get at the information that the, maybe we don't already have trained models for? Second, biodiversity data has a very long tail. Um, so this is just looking at the first 16 million observations in iNaturalist. And if you take the rough rule of thumb that you need 100 independently collected examples from a given species to be able to automated automatically recognize it um using a machine learning model which is like you know everyone always asks me like well how many labeled data do i need to be able to get this to work and it's like well, it depends <laughs> like you can't there really isn't such thing as like a perfect rule for this but if you take this rough assumption you need 100 independent samples there are about 10,000 species in those first 16 million observations that have enough data right where we have enough data to reasonably be able to identify them. There's another order of magnitude, more species that were cited that are below that threshold. And humans are able to identify new species with like maybe three to five examples. So there's a long way to go in terms of this low shot problem, being able to identify things with less examples, doing more with less data, because in the, in the natural world, Basically, we're always going to be chasing this long tail and endangered species, rare species can sometimes be the most scientifically important to recognize accurately, but our models are explicitly biased against them. And then last, but definitely not least, biodiversity data is not IID. It's not independently and identically distributed. For one thing, species are moving around all the time. We see migration seasonally, but then also these things change year to year. And with climate change, they are constantly changing in ways that we don't expect. And so even if you were able to collect a perfect representative data set of the distribution of all species on earth today, that distribution is different from next year, definitely different from three years from now. And so you cannot, you can no longer make the assumption that the data you want to train the model on and the data you want to use the model on are going to be independently and identically distributed. And then we don't even have that. We don't have the ability to collect this perfectly representative data set of where biodiversity is and all the species on earth. What we have is on the, on the right, we've got, this is just an estimate of alpha diversity. It's the number of unique species in any given place on earth. And on the left, what we have is a map of the species occurrence data in the global biodiversity information facility. So where we actually have data. You can see these things are almost anti-correlated. What we have is data in countries that have traditionally been wealthy. And what we don't have is the same sort of density of data in the areas where we have maximal biodiversity, where we have biodiversity hotspots. So the data is not IID in multiple dimensions, which means that we cannot rely on or we cannot um, build sort of our methods around the assumption that we are going to have IID data. And that is a fundamental assumption in all of modern machine learning pretty much. Um, so this is, this is a big challenge, and this is one that we need to address. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is ways to try to measure and overcome the performance differences due to that domain shift, that distribution shift. And I'll particularly be talking about this in the frame of static cameras. Um, so these are the camera trap records in, um, in Wildlife Insights, which is a like, global scale repository to try to curate and de-silo camera trapping efforts. It's um, partnership between Google, I'm on the AI team for this, have been for about four years, and about 30 different NGOs, large scale NGOs globally. So WWF, Smithsonian, Wildlife Conservation Society, you name it. There's about 55 million camera trap images um, currently from 43 countries, but it's still very sparse. And then when we're talking about static cameras, 
it actually really exemplifies this distribution shift problem in two really interesting ways. And we can start breaking down the ways that you have domain shift and how those affect machine learning models really effectively with static cameras. And the reason for that is because it gives you two different dimensions of shift really concretely. The first of those is what we call subpopulation shift. So this is basically the distribution across the set of all species you're interested in for each individual center sensor is unique. The reason for this is mostly microhabitats and animal habits. So for example, we have one camera in LA, 90% of the data is bobcats. Bobcats are not 90% of the animals in LA. It just turns out that that camera trap is next to a bobcat den. And so we just get tons and tons of examples of bobcat data. And with a naive approach, what you end up getting is a model that every time that bobcat, bobcat image is like a little difficult, kind of blurry, it predicts domestic cat because that is the prior that's learned. Domestic cats are much more common in LA than bobcats. So this is like the way, some of the ways that this can be affected. The other dimension of shift is visual shift. And that's like, you actually look at the static background of these cameras, they're very fixed. Um, and not just the habitat itself is reasonably similar over time. Um, for any individual camera, the orientation and the size and the shape at which you see that species is going to be quite repetitive. And so it's really exemplifying some of the challenges that we see where something might look different in a different place. Um, and this combination of subpopulation shift and visual shift um, does really exemplify a lot of the domain shift challenges we see with machine learning models. And what we see is that models do not generalize. So this is a, a paper from a few years ago, one of the first to really explicitly explore this, you know, what is the reproducibility <laughs> of the machine learning models that we have that have something like 99% accuracy that sounds so great. What does that mean when you try to use it? And it turns out when you try to use it, it's almost always going to be out of domain. And so what we did is we explicitly looked at training on a set of cameras and then evaluating on data from those cameras held out in time. So now this is like the next sort of month or years. Um, so those are the in distribution cameras and then training on new cameras from the exact same region, exact same set of species, but just not the exact identical camera locations that we saw before. And if you, these are best fit lines through the species of interest, what you can see here, and then this is number of training examples. So you can see that when you have fewer examples, when you're in that long tail, it's just hard. It doesn't matter if you're in distribution or outer distribution. Yeah, there's a little bit of a change in the error there, but like it is very hard to identify rare species. But the other important thing is that this gap persists as you increase the number of training examples and is actually growing. And so the number of examples you would need to be able to generalize well is orders of magnitude more when you're going out of distribution. And we often just do not have that scale of data. And it turns out this type of distribution shift and particularly the performance drops due to real world domain shift are completely ubiquitous. This is a, a benchmark that I put together with a bunch of other really amazing researchers across a ton of different applications where we're really trying to point out to the computer vision and the machine learning communities that the way that we're thinking about domain shift or domain adaptation was often on these toy data sets and that the methods that worked on those toy data sets, like taking MNIST digits and rotating them 90 degrees, that really didn't exemplify the domain shift in the real world. And that methods that worked well on those fake data sets did not work in the real world. And what we actually found when we published this is that Standard empirical risk minimization outperformed almost all of the state-of-the-art methods in domain adaptation at the time. And now we're finally seeing start, people start to work on building domain adaptation methods that do work in these scenarios. And the interesting thing is there is no such thing as a method that works for all of them. Because each of these, and we break down in the paper, each of these characterizes different dimensions of the trade-off between subpopulation shift and visual shift. And some methods handle one or the other more effectively. So how do we close this gap for static sensors? You know, it's like, yeah, okay, these things don't work. Is there anything we can do? Um, so what we found experimentally is like, you know, if you, hmm, oh goodness, okay. Uh, <laughs> if, you, um, if you try to basically reduce the impact of those two things, you try to reduce the impact of that visual shift by moving from whole image classification to localization. And this is now bounding box detection, but we've also explored even like semantic segmentation or instant segmentation. If you remove and you explicitly give more information to the model about foreground versus background, it is better able to disambiguate those two things. And that does help you generalize. 
So we see better results from classifiers trained on crops than the whole image. Pretty straightforward. The other thing we found is that if you reduce the impact of the subpopulation shift in a really hacky way by basically just saying, okay, we know the distributions across all of these different species of animals are different. We're just gonna walk our way up the taxonomic tree and just predict animal. That generalizes very well. And so what we found, and I did this work with Microsoft AI for Earth, is that we could build a detector that just detects humans, animals, and vehicles. That is, you know, so object detection, three categories, very coarse grained. So now we're moving away from the specificity to get generalizability. And that thing does work, not only sort of with the species and the habitats it's trained on, it also works off the shelf for people who are working in completely different ecosystems. Somehow that general category of animal in camera trap is able to capture and able to work without needing to be retrained for a lot of people globally. And it turns out when you understand what works in practice, like you, you actually explicitly think of this really, you know, robust evaluation strategy, you can figure out what to deploy and then it will have an impact. So this model is now used by about 80 different NGOs as a really fundamental part of their data processing pipeline. Um, and it's, it's useful for a huge variety of end users. Um, so one example of the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, they use this to help with their wolf population management policy. About 2,000 cameras across Idaho, 11 million images collected a year. And in the past, before they started using machine learning at all, they were about five years behind in processing their data, and that was just growing. So it meant that they were setting policy about you know, what they could or could not do about the wolves based on data that was five years out of date. Um, and now, with machine learning, they're actually able to just reduce, they're doing, we're doing selective prediction. They tune a threshold that is sort of the right trade-off for them in terms of the amount of human effort they still need to label and the risks. And then they only have to human verify 15% of their images. And they're actually processing the data in the year it's collected. And so this kind of participatory system where you're able to filter out a lot of the imagery and really let humans focus on some of it becomes very impactful and, and successfully usable by people setting policy. And then beyond that, we've explored actually, how do you get the species classifier to work well? So it turns out if you just want this thing to work well for like your set of 200 cameras, you can do that. I mean, it's still gonna struggle with rare species. That's maybe a different thing. And I'll talk a bit more about that next, but you can get much better results if you have access to the data you're going to want to use the model on. And so then what we did is we use the fact that we know that there's this visual similarity over time. And we say, okay, now we have a whole unlabeled set of data from a completely new ecosystem. We have no existing labels or training for the species we're likely to see, but we're going to leverage this really robust detector to find all of the animals in that data. We're going to cluster it using some sort of feature embedding model that we train in, in a metric learning space. So it's maximally separable and distance has meaning. Um, and then we cluster those using priors from the ecologists locally about what the right number of clusters should be, what, how many different species of animals do they think they're going to see? And then they go in, they label a few examples per cluster. We kind of do some heuristics to make sure that actually these clusters do look reasonable, often they do. Then we use that label, propagate it to the whole cluster, iterate, and then retrain a model on that. We found that we can get to the exact same performance as a fully supervised model with 99.5% fewer labels. So you can really make this process of just letting an ecologist process their own data much more efficient by just actually tuning specific models to those specific networks. So while we're trying to figure out how do we get models that work everywhere for everyone, we can also think about specialization efficiently. Um, so how do we learn from imperfect data? So there's a you really probably can't see them at all here, but there's about five endangered grevy zebra in this picture in the fog. Mm -hmm. um, you maybe see some stripes like, I don't know, like here-ish, nah? Anyway, the point is data is imperfect. Um, so one of the things I talked about is that rare classes are hard, right? Um, one thing we've done to try to improve that is using is generating synthetic data of rare species using game engines actually to try to make different varieties of poses and orientations and distances from the camera for rare species, and then using GANs, generative adversarial networks, to increase the realism of those synthetic images. And we can get 70% accuracy boost on rare species, 
without affecting the performance on common species and without needing to generate synthetic data for common species. Because it turns out building the 3D model for each of these animals, that's the bottleneck. Um, now, I think one of the things that's quite exciting is we're seeing really great advances in generative image, image technology, things like Dolly. So as those become maybe closer and closer to something that's usable for science, currently they're not if you ask it to make a bobcat, it puts a tail on it half the time. So they're more confusing than useful. But as they start to get better, as we start to think about ways to build these generative systems that maybe don't need explicit built in um, 3D articulatable models for every species of interest, um, potentially we can really start to increase the and, and do better on that long tail by just using the right kind of clever, essentially data, ad, data augmentation via synthesis. So how does an expert label something like this? I got this image from ecologists and it had a label. And I was like, I don't believe you. <laughs> what are you seeing there? But what we found is that, you know, these expert ecologists, they're not, they're not doing this, just looking at one image at a time, right? What they're doing is they're looking at context other images from that same camera location. And they'll look at images over sometimes months of data. What they do is they, they will label all of the data from one camera trap at a time. And the reason for that, now that I've sort of done it myself, you start to learn that camera trap. You learn where the species are likely to be. You learn what species are likely to be there. And you're able to identify things using that information, those priors that you build in your own brain that you would never be able to identify with just that single image alone. And so really like this is a wildebeest. And once you, someone's talked me through it, you're like, okay, so this is the only species of that size and shape that shows up in this type of group at this time of day. It's almost certainly a wildebeest. There's nothing else it could be. You're like, oh, okay, that's believable, right? I mean, no, it still might not be correct, but it's a reasonable estimate. It's a reasonable assumption. This is something that no one could do just looking at that one image by itself. So what we tried to do is figure out how do we build in that domain knowledge about what makes these problems tractable when they're very hard um, into our machine learning methods. And so what we did is we took a two pass approach where the first stage we build contextual memory, a representative sort of set of what has been seen as just a matrix for every single camera location. So you go through, you, you run through about a month of data and you extract representative features for you know, specific animals in each of these cameras and you build up this matrix. You also keep when and where the image was taken, but also where in the image the box is. So you have these priors around like the locations that where, where animals are likely to show up. And then what we do is we incorporate that attention block, that, that memory bank via attention in the middle of the two stage object detection pipeline. So now the first stage, the model says, I think all of these things are maybe objects. And in the second stage, it tries to tell you what objects they are. And so what we do is we inject that memory in between. So now before the model tries to say, what objects are these things? It gets to look across all the things that have been seen. And it learns this projection space of like how to actually compare those things. And then it incorporates that information. And it's a pretty standard attention block. Um, you know, this is, was originally formulated for natural language processing. Um, it's the building block of the transformer. If you guys have heard of that, I'm sure lots of you have. Um, and we've also tried sort of, you know, this is just a very simple version, but we've tried multi-layered, multi-headed attention, and you do get increases in performance, but at a, at a sort of expense of additional complexity. So that's kind of a trade-off that depending on the use case, you might want to take or not. We tried this on multiple camera trap data sets, but also on a traffic camera data set, because really there's nothing about what we're trying to do here that's specific to animals. It's more about how do we take advantage of the structure of data from a static camera to be able to make use of these long-term temporal reasoning that's possible. And we found that we did see pretty major improvements in mean average precision. So close to 20%, which is, which is pretty notable, but also like being fair, like the model got to see a lot more information. We also compared to things like sort of other existing temporal approaches like video or some of these heuristics. And because they really weren't designed for this scenario where you have low frame rates and it's sort of, you know, non-uniform distribution of sampling, a lot of those methods really struggled. Whereas this worked quite well. And qualitatively, what we see is that it's adaptive to relevance. So because you're not saying like, oh, you need to aggregate in some specific way over this specific time window, you let it choose what's maybe most important that the weights in that attention model. What we'll find is that 
you know, in this first example, this is a warthog that uses the same game trail almost every day. And you can see that it's really taking all of that information and pulling it together over time to make the decision. Whereas in the bottom example, it decided the most important or useful information was just other examples from that same occurrence, same detection event um, of this, you know, Thompson's gazelle just hanging out in front of the camera and grazing for hours at a time. And it really does improve on the hard stuff. So what we find is that the improvements are really on these cases where the animals may be entering or leaving the frame is occluded in the background or um, is hidden and, you know, things like that foggy example, the wildebeest or, um, or like these examples of impala in the dark. So I think the point here that I'm trying to make is that we can move beyond the idea that all data, all image data is kind of in a vacuum that you just get one image at a time. I mean, try to think about how to incorporate more of the structure of these like, you know, structured data collection domains to really see massive improvements in machine learning methodology. And finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of these participatory aspects. How do we actually go about deploying efficient human AI systems for ecology and conservation? So the first thing is um, we have what we call Elephant Book. It's an individual elephant identification system that's being used to monitor the elephant population in the Mara. Um, and this has been deployed in the Greater Mara ecosystem for about three years now. And the important thing here is that we designed this so that the data collection protocol would be well aligned with computer vision training, but would also be giving the information to the ecologists that they needed from the beginning. So you're building it so it's actually going to be useful and usable, incentivizing ecologists to actually use the system. So we started with no training data and we leveraged what's called SEEK. This is like this coding system developed by pachydermists to help um, non-experts identify individual elephants using like ear contours and kind of like things like tusk bending. Um, and what we do is we use that coding system. We slowly build up the number of representations or sightings of each elephant. And we start to train computer vision models in the background and evaluate them over time. So we're always evaluating them sort of on the last week of data. And then that gets incorporated the next week of data. So you have this constant sense of really what is the performance of that model in practice in this living environment, as opposed to some sort of fixed static benchmark data set. Um, and then what we do is as we build more confidence for certain individuals or certain types of images, we start to trust that model more. So we're slowly increasing the amount that the model is doing versus what the human is actually asked to do. And we're currently working on switching over to a model where we only query information from the humans when we have major uncertainty. So, you know, specific queries for information from a human user, as opposed to starting with human input and then increasing the accuracy with the computer vision model. And sort of similarly, we're trying to explore the trade-offs in individual animal identification possibility from human collected data to camera trap data and trying to understand the differences in population estimate and distribution that you get when you have these very, very different types of sensing. And what we found is that there are a lot of images from the camera traps that would not be traditionally identifiable, um, but we can actually try to incorporate some of that spatial and temporal context to do even better. So similar to our attention model for species ID, we can start using that for individual ID as well. Um, and like another example, which I think is fun, uh, we work with the uh, Alaska Department of Fish and Game and NOAA and a bunch of other departments of Fish and Game to automate escapement estimation. So now this is a challenge. This is a multi-object tracking challenge from a computer vision perspective, but it's a non-standard multi-object tracking challenge because there's no visual re-identifiability between the objects. We think about multi-object tracking and computer vision, you see a lot of these like self-driving car data sets where like every car looks pretty different, honestly. Like okay, maybe once or twice you get like two of the exact same make, model, and color that like are the same amount of dirty or something. And that might be a bit of a fine-grained challenge. But most of the time, what we found is that you can just completely shuffle the frames and you get the same performance because the models are really focusing on visual re-identifiability. But there's not anything about these salmon and sonar data that's visually re-identifiable. So it's actually a space where you need the motion information. And we're incorporating classic techniques with deep learning, things like calm and filtering, to try to, to kind of bridge the gap and see better generalizability. And we really find that, again, like always, the problem is we can do really well on rivers we're training on. Training on. We move to new rivers without any training data, and we see big performance drop-offs. And so now what we're looking at is for this slightly simpler scenario, 
Can we actually do online adaptation of the models? Can we start to figure out how to adapt these models to get them to perform well in a new river without any training data? Um, and more and more, can we move that entire process to the edge? Because these things are in very remote environments across you know, Northern Alaska and the Yukon, where we don't have the bandwidth to send the data to the cloud. And we don't really have the capacity to put, I mean, maybe we could put a GPU at every place, but really it's more the human capacity. How do you get the humans to the location to be able to do some sort of quality control or review? So now it's this, this question of what is the right distributed system for something that is going to set pretty important policy and, and where you know, mistakes are high risk um, to actually be able to use these models in practice. And finally, and this is something I'm really excited about, we're looking at trying to efficiently answer new ecological questions. So take the 120 million pictures of plants and animals and bugs in iNaturalist. We have species ID models, but now ecologists want to know everything else. <laughs> they wanna know how old are they, these animals? They want to know, are they healthy? They want to know how many are there? They wanna know contextual information. Like, can you find me every example of a raptor sitting on a telephone pole? Because it turns out that actually, we want to be able to argue for a specific type of policy around raptor nesting on telephone poles in deforested areas. There's an infinite set of questions that you could answer from the data we've already collected if you could figure out how to get the information out. And so we're looking at universal representations and actually moving more towards queryable systems for science from already existing natural imagery collections. So open challenges, things that I think we all need to work on. We want to make better use of the multimodal data we have. Every single thing I've talked about so far has been some sort of specific model for a specific type of data. But none of these data modalities are sufficient by themselves. Um, audio is amazing because you get like pretty great um, like range, but it's only good for loud species. It doesn't do much for you if your species are quiet. Um, camera traps are awesome for like mint to large terrestrial mammals, but there's a ton of things you don't really accurately capture in most standard camera traps. Satellite imagery has amazing spatial and temporal scale, but you can't see anything under the canopy. So what are the ways that we can bring together all of these different modalities at different scales, different resolutions, and with different sort of complementary focus areas or sort of biases within the taxonomy. How do we bring those together to do a better job? And one of the ways, the way that we're currently digging into this at Google is by trying to build systems to automate tree censusing in cities using a combination of satellite imagery and Google Street View data and iNaturalist data. So bringing together all three of these modalities to build an accurate map of the locations and the species of individual trees in every city in North America. Um, we also want to incorporate more domain expertise into our methods. I talked about trying to learn from ecologists how they do the hard stuff. Um, so one way we're doing that now is we're looking at incorporating and building social priors for social species to help us better re-identify groups of individuals. So can you take all of these different types of social species, everything from whales to zebras to elephants, and let domain experts inform these network models of their social network about things like known fission fusion properties of those social networks, and then incorporate that effectively and get better re-identifiability of groups of individuals. And finally, I think it's very important to develop accessible and equitable technology. And I think that that's probably something that a lot of people in this room are really interested in as well. So really that means no parachute science. It means me not going, collecting a bunch of data from camera trappers across Africa, being like, thank you, this is such an interesting machine learning problem, and writing a machine learning paper about it and walking away. Um, we need to really be making sure that the methods that we're purporting or that we even have some sort of sustainability plan where you're going to actually have benefit and impact to the NGOs, to the land managers, to the people that you're working with to curate the data. Um, and I think one way that we should be thinking about in terms of equity and accessibility is model efficiency. And that's not just model efficiency in terms of computation, it's also model efficiency in terms of re reliability and robustness to hyperparameters. Because if you need to tune your model like a thousand different times to find the one example that works, that is no longer a tractable solution for an, an NGO that maybe has to really stretch to cover the GPU training cost or the inference cost for the methods. So the more we think about the efficiency of the models we use, the more accessible they're going to be. Um, 
But then beyond that, I think we need to think about increasing interdisciplinary capacity. Um, we're never going to have enough computer scientists to like train all of the models that are going to be specialized for all of these different end use cases. And so I really think there's this value in trying to empower people in other domains to do their own computer vision, applied computer vision for their own problems. Um, so there's two ways I've been thinking about that. I've started, we're now on our second round of this summer school in computer vision methods for ecology, where we bring graduate students, postdocs, early faculty in ecology with their own data that they've collected, their own scientific questions and Python experience, because we're not, this is not like a Python school. And that's, that's another thing. Now we need a different school to teach Python to ecologists, but separate thing. Now, if you can program in Python, we can in three weeks train you where you write your own code to train, evaluate, and deploy your models for your research questions. And we do this with a lot of really hands-on co-work time, but it's been really effective. And actually three of the people from last year's summer school, just last August, have already gotten now jobs in ecology with an AI and data science component that they would not have been eligible for without this type of um, pretty rapid skill building. And then I also run an AI for Conservation Slack channel. It's got about a thousand plus researchers now worldwide who work in this intersection. And that's a really amazing way to try to make it easier for non-experts to get information about best practices, what's being done, not reinventing the wheel. Don't invest your effort in building another data labeling tool. There are enough data labeling tools, probably just use one and like work on the next step. I'm just trying to help make these things scale because there's just not enough people in computer science and data science to scale to all of the problems that this is useful for. Cool. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, So anybody has a question, I'll bring a mic up to you. See there's someone up the top and I've never got this morning. Thank you for your talk. Um, very interesting. Um, it struck me that when you said NGOs don't have access to GPUs, do you think that um, Google will kind of uh, you know, give broader access to folks? Um, no. So what I think Google will do um, is temporary. So, so if you're an NGO, um, what you can often do is sometimes there are existing credit programs or something like Microsoft AI for Earth or Google through cloud or AWS will have some sort of accreditation program where they will give you credits for a year or for two years or some fixed amount of credits. What you cannot depend on, and I've actually seen this failure mode happen, is an NGO builds its AI like funding plan, its infrastructure plan around the idea that those are going to be free, that gets taken away, and then they can't afford to do it anymore. And actually I've been pushing NGOs more and more like buy your own GPUs, keep it in house because you cannot, unfortunately I'm getting so jaded, you cannot trust big companies and their greenwashing plans to support sustainably your conservation goals. Are you, are you also spreading that uh, message to Google? Uh yeah. But you know, they don't, it's an, I can have a downturn. They don't really listen to me. I'm also like, a, nobody, you know, I can yell about it all I want, but in the end, like they do have their own sort of financial needs. And so I think that this is something, it's not just me. Lots of people and big companies are trying to figure out what is the sustainable way to support this sort of thing. And I don't think, I don't think it's been found sustainable yet. The other potential option because I agree that every individual NGO, their funding structures are so variable and so complicated that like having all of this support, the tech support to be able to have your own GPs in house is hard. Um, I think what is starting to happen more and more is um, either like larger scale NGOs or specifically like NOAA, for example, right now is building out a pretty amazing in-house cluster for ocean science. And like, um, so Kakani Katia, who's at Ambari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium and Research Institute, she's been doing a pretty amazing effort to try to get scalable, you know, large taxonomic coverage, machine learning ready, undersea training data together. And she's just been able to negotiate with NOAA for a 75 year data hosting and training plan. Um, so 75 years, that actually starts to feel like something you can depend on. Obviously, I'm not worried about 
our capacity in this country yeah. to have those resources. I'm worried about, uh, you know, other well, countries. So you'd be astonished actually at how many NGOs or even just like state agencies, like really, it's, it's not that they don't, it's not that it's not possible. It's just that like, it's not traditional and these, in, the infrastructure can move quite slowly. So like changing your funding model to now have some amount of funding every year going to machine learning infrastructure for like a, you know, the Department of Fish and Game in Idaho. Like that's not necessarily something that's easy to do. So I think that we'll get there in the US, but I think outside of the US, you're right that like everything does get much harder. Um, yeah. I had another question too. Um, so your, so how scalable is, are these methods if you're talking about climate change, right? So you said, you know, you have to tune your, your models to specific streams Obviously, you also acknowledge that climate change is happening. So how, like, what is the return rate? Do we have to do this every year? Or like, I mean, I, I know you're, you're proposing these participatory ways to, to, to parameterize these models and that sort of thing. But um, so what's the future? And can you give a vision of like how we can, can yeah, create this, I don't know, these architectures so that we can carry on this kind of work? So I think more and more, we're going to be moving to a space where we have semi-standard um, backbones for representation learning that are maybe very large scale, things like, you know, these huge clip models or whatever that are trained multimodally on the entire internet, but are structurally quite different from maybe the types of data that we work on. Maybe we do train, you know, pretty large scale models on all of iNaturalist data or something. You have these stable backbones that are pre-trained that you don't actually change much. And we start moving to very lightweight tuning of like single end layers that happens somewhat consistently and through like a sort of protocolized system for human verification or review. So basically you're moving to a system where, you know, every river based on the way the models are performing, but also based on other dimensions of knowledge. So understanding when was there a catastrophic weather event that we think might have fundamentally changed the structure of the bathymetry of that river so that we might want to just check in again and make sure the model's still performing the way we want. I think that we're not going to, we're not going to get to a point where these things are completely 100% accurate and fully automa automatable, honestly, ever. Like I, that's not, that's not the expectation. But what we are going to move into is making it understanding and building the methods that enable you to really spend a lot less human time to monitor a lot more area. And, and this retuning process becomes really lightweight. So we just submitted a paper to um, ICCV that was explicitly on model joint model compression and specialization. So you start with this, you know, very large, you know, 750 billion parameter model. Can you jointly using a set of calibration data, both compress and specialize that model to get better results for a specific use case. Um, and I think that type of, um, that's maybe where we're gonna move anyway with academic AI research, because we're not going to be training those backbones like industry is. Yeah. Do you see any ways to privatization your research? Can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Do you see any ways that privatize, uh, feel like, microphones. I don't know. I think it's for the people on Zoom if there's people on Zoom. Ah, yeah. nice. Do you see any ways uh, privatization? So any of your research or any of the technology that you're working with, um, sometimes there could be a nice coupling between private endeavors and academic endeavors. Do you see any opportunities for privatization to spin something out or generate revenue to help in these efforts? So there's a lot of different people exploring this. Um, so like a few different examples are like different flavors of private versus open source versions for like GUIs and infrastructure that sit around the models that kind of help the humans like more easily verify or understand or adapt. Um, just even things like tuning the thresholds that are used. Um, I think the challenge is really that Right now, the economics is still not super clear around things like biodiversity. Um, and I think people are moving into the space of trying to understand how to monetize and regulate biodiversity and like natural effects, just like how we're starting to see markets around carbon. So that's been, there's been a lot of sort of noise around that at sort of upper echelons of things like the World Bank. I think to be able to do that effectively, we need impact assessment. We need to actually really be able to verify um, kind of 
the the policies that are made or the choices that are made or that you know some area that says yes we're making these choices to protect biodiversity that's actually happening um so i think we're not going to get to a really stable economic system without it's a bit chicken and egg i suppose um but I do think that people are trying to privatize it. I think that there are areas that um, are more maybe privatizable than others. So a lot of this technology can be used then for like hunting. Um, so, and then we do see privatization of this type of thing in the hunting industry um, much more scalably, but like the, just the economics for NGOs trying to do biodiversity preservation um, is a bit complicated still. So. Yeah, follow up question. So I'm no longer a graduate student, but when I was a graduate student and doing research, um, just to sort of explore that topic a little bit more, one of the things that uh, I came across was that was right when NOAA started to make available their data to predict El Ninos mm -hmm. and all that data from all of their buoys out in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it was really interesting to see all that data. And then I correlated that data with um, commodities. Mm -hmm. And so that became a you know something that you could look at in terms of like, how is the weather going to affect commodity prices and use that to make financial predictions? Yeah. And, um, and so like sometimes in research, we could come across data, which could have financial applications, which could then generate revenue to help us achieve our goals and our aims. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of also what I think about when I talk about privatization. And um, I just wonder if you, you know, ever seen anything like that, like, wow, that'd be a really interesting opportunity beyond what you've already spoken to. I think there are people who are more entrepreneurial than me that are doing a better job of this. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I don't know, pretty stubbornly like, no, these things need to be accessible and as cheap as possible. And I understand that we need to figure out ways to make that financially viable. Um, but at least for now, I think I'm, I'm more interested in maybe um, finding ways to build better regulation that make these things required to be monitored as opposed to, um, trying to figure out how to build a capitalistic model to prevent extractive practices, it gets really challenging. But I, I think there are other people, there's like an entire VC now called Superorganism that's like explicitly looking at what are the ways we can privatize biodiversity monitoring. It's just not really my, my wheelhouse, I'd say. Yeah, well, thank you for your efforts. It's uh, <laughs> pretty shocking and a little bit discouraging and disheartening to hear 69% of species. Yeah and uh, wildlife populations have decreased. Well, so it's not 69% of species, it's 69% of population. So it's maybe, I don't know, it depends on what you think, if that's better or worse. Like that just means like 69% of the animals alive on earth in 1970, they're now gone. Like we have 30% yeah. of the animals left. Yeah, it's shocking. Yeah. Thanks for your talk. So uh, I wonder, so, you know, in ecology, there are lots of skating relationships, skating relationships, mm -hmm. like for example, the way- I think it's off, yeah. Hello? Yeah, so a skating relationship means that if you know a lot about the abundant species, then you know a little bit about the rare species. Mm -hmm. Much similar like what you did for the camera trap data, you look at the image before and after, and then you infer in between. So have you thought about these kind of skating relationships in terms of helping the inference and prediction of yeah. the algorithms. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, and, and it's work that is kind of ongoing. We've been more and more interested in how we can apply machine learning methods to things like species distribution modeling. And um, some of my colleagues have been doing like some really amazing work in that space with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology with the eBird data, and then also with iNaturalist data. And what, what they found is that if you train on the hundred most abundant species, you can build species distribution models across those that are maybe reasonably spatially accurate. But if you scale up to a thousand species, you start to see much finer grained spatial structure that comes out in the models. Um, and so I think as we're actually figuring out how to move from more traditional methods for species distribution modeling that are very restrictive in terms of the number of species you can jointly model together, you know, maybe one, maybe just two, we can now move to jointly modeling a thousand or 10,000 species, we actually do see much better performance, particularly in 
those spaces or for those species that are very rare. So I do think that there's these scaling properties do hold an analysis. It's just, we need to change the methods from maybe what we were traditionally working on. Yeah, that's super interesting. You know, the emerging literature on joint spatial distribution model, that's also the area that I worked on. The other question is more of a big picture question. Have you thought about the relationship between biodiversity and more directly linking to, let's say carbon and other things directly related to climate change? I mean, of course I've thought about it. Um, I actually, one thing that I've been reading about a bunch recently is bioturbation. Um, like basically the way, so, you know, carbon cycles in trees are on the order of maybe a hundred years. Carbon cycles in, in soil are more like a thousand years. And it seems like current, like outcoming research seems to suggest that bioturbation, basically the underground small mammals, bugs, and then the microbes are really fundamental in actually transmitting huge amounts of carbon from trees into the soil. And so I think that there's definitely a lot more to understand, but I do think it's really exciting to try to figure out what are the ways that our natural ecosystems are kind of shifting those carbon cycles into things that are more stable. Thank you. So earlier in your talk, you talked about the long-term uh, context for the pre-camera. So I was wondering uh, if the attention mechanism can recapture uh, the human expertise way of identifying, like, is there a way to like interpret the model uh, since that was like motivated by a human expert? Um, and then I guess another follow-up question, another question is uh, how big do you think is the gap between like multimodality, um, like in current say like text to, video like that you see on like mm -hmm. like the um, businesses and how big is the gap with like your field uh like uh yeah. in the scientific domain Thanks. all right so the first question um so the problem with qualitative analysis of machine learning models is that humans are really good at storytelling so we look at the results so one of the ways if you do a simple attention mechanism so instead of multi-layered multi-headed attention you just take a single attention block for just long-term attention and you look at the weights in, in that model, um, the attention weights that are learned now, which is sort of in this projected space of like, what is maybe the most useful information? You can then interpret those weights as corresponding to um, maybe what the model is choosing to pay attention to. And we found some really interesting properties there. So for example, if there are kind of salient false positives, and remember these cameras we're testing this on were not cameras that were seen during training, right? So, so you can have a rock or something that in certain lighting conditions looks a bit like a skunk. Um, what we will see is humans really quickly learn to ignore that rock. And what we'll see is that the model will actually pay attention to that same rock in different lighting conditions and then suppress the confidence that it's a species. Um, and then similarly, like we've had examples of, let's say there's a two different species of spur fowl in Kenya. There's a red necked and a yellow necked. You really can't identify them unless you can see the neck. And what we have seen is that the model will um, pay attention to the example with the, the neck that are sort of close by in time. Um, with high weight. So it, it, so there's, you can put a human layer of interpretation on top of it. I, I feel a little bit uncomfortable sort of saying like, yes, it is doing what humans do, but like there, are, we have seen things that seem to suggest that it's learning useful patterns in the data, even on, you know, cases it hasn't been trained on. With the multimodality, I think this is really interesting. So one of the assumptions that gets made, not always, but, but frequently with um, existing efforts in multimodality in computer science is some amount of paired data. Not always, but a lot of it, you know, video plus audio or video plus text. It, it's relying on the fact that you have pretty good, you know, speech to text models, and then you have you know, the images. So you have all of these things paired together. You have the image frame plus the audio signal plus the corresponding text and they're all registered. What we have in these types of data are things that are weakly geospatially related but they're completely heterogeneously sampled. So you'll have, you know, okay, we have planet data, planet scope data that flies over every day and it has this resolution. And then, but it's at 10.30 a.m. And then maybe we get a camera trap picture from like 7 p.m. <laughs> and it's like in this specific location and maybe one over here at a different time. And then maybe three months ago, someone did like a really high resolution study, spatial study of all of the like woody vegetation in this very small subset of the area. So you have all of these things where they, they are complementary and they're probably 
there's a way to leverage that information and bring it together. But we no longer have this implicit pairing or even this the way to get this implicit pairing that people, all these tricks that people are often doing in the multimodal data now, where they'll be like, all right, use like image to text to generate some reasonable text that would correspond to this image. Now use that as a weak supervision signal, go back the other way. Like there's, there's ways that they're kind of generating pairings of those modalities that are harder to do for us. And one of the reasons I'm working on trees as we're starting to study this is because the trees don't move. So I do have like one flavor of like co-registration that I can believe in or can depend on. So now I can say, okay, these are different views from these different sensors and they're maybe they're not perfectly aligned in space. So there's some wiggle, um, but we can think about co-registering pixels across street level views or from space. Um, and that's why I'm working on trees, but extending that to things that move is like a whole another can of worms. Thank you. Uh, we have time for perhaps one more question. Uh, regarding generating synthetic uh, data for model, uh, uh, model enhancement, uh, do you think it's possible to use gaming engines like Unreal Engine and a Unity Engine to generate uh, lifelike pictures for uh, neural network training? Yeah, so that's what we did actually. We used oh. Unreal. Um, we used the Unreal Engine, and we used. Um, we basically did a case study with uh, articulatable species models that have been generating generated for hunting games. So we like okay. looked at deer and wolves and foxes and uh, maybe like also elk. Um, and we we found that just generating the synthetic data alone, um, you could get maybe like forty percent improvement ish on on these species. And this is going from like you know, 6% accuracy with three training, real training examples to, you know, 46%. So like okay. pretty major dec decrease in error. And then with GANs on top of that, to try to increase the realism of those images, we could get up to 70% improvement. But the important thing is they weren't pixel to pixel GANs. Um, they were actually GANs trained to just tweak the low level statistical parameters of the images that performed better than something like a cycle GAN or some sort of like, pixel specific, let's generate a more realistic version of this. It was really just taking that synthetic data and getting it to match the contrast, the lighting, the color um, of the real data actually performed better and was more reliable. Okay. Um, but then, like I said, the challenge is really like, it's not easy or cheap to generate those 3D articulatable models of a species. Um, so that then becomes the bottleneck. And I think that there, so there's lines of research looking at doing that more efficiently. Um, Angju Kanazawa at Berkeley and Michael Black at Max Planck both explicitly work on efficient 3D model generation from very few image examples for different species, so birds and different things. So there's that dimension, which I think is promising. Um, and then also kind of in parallel, we're seeing better sort of generation or conditional generation um, of data uh, using things like Dolly. So for example, what would be cool is actually, can we build like conditional generation engines? And, and particularly something I'm very interested in here is invasive species detection, where you were never going to have an example of that species in that place, right? Because it's invasive. The whole point is you need to find the rats on the islands when they get there, but they've never been there before. <laughs> um, so can you actually then look at conditional generation where you take empty images from that specific camera where you want to detect rats, and you take maybe masks of actual rodents and place them in those images and then conditionally generate the sort of pixels that would build you this like synthetic or augmented data of rats in that place. Maybe that would be a more effective way to try to do it um, more efficiently without building a bunch of 3D models. <laughs> all right, thank you. Yes, let's all thank Sarah for her talk.